Okay, I'm John. Uh, I'm the outreach manager. This is Rosie. She's our executive director. Uh, Phil is walking in the back there. He's the president of ARDC. Uh, who am I not seeing? I think other folks are going to trickle in. Okay. Yeah. So we're good. We're ready to go. So the way we're formatting it this year is we're going to do a quick overview of ARDC. And then we've got some of our grantees here in the audience, and we want you to have the opportunity to interact with them, see what their experiences were like, and also get ideas from them of what's been successful and so on. So, so we'll go through this real quick. Uh, back in 81, Hank Magnuski, uh, approached John Bostel, Bos, Postel, sorry, I'm having a little blood sugar issue here, um, and he went to him and said, could we have some uh, internet addresses for use for amateur radio, and was awarded um, a Class A network, which is 16 million IP addresses. So... So in 2011, uh, it was decided that it was best to have a nonprofit organization to act as the holder of those IT addresses. And then in 2019, we took the opportunity to sell off 4 million of those addresses and that created an endowment, which we now use to fund a bunch of scholarships and grants and so on. Unfortunately, Brian decided to uh, cross the rainbow in that time frame, and Phil took over the leadership of the organization. Uh, we have an active board of directors, uh, some of whom you can meet here this weekend. We have a staff um, represented here. So the resources that the organization has, oh, sure. That works great. Okay, that'll work great. No, 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 it's not a joke. Appreciate it. So, um, we have 12 million legacy IPv4 addresses that are still owned by the organization, and we make those av available to amateur radio projects at no cost. You have to provide your own networking infrastructure, but we provide uh, these addresses. Um, so, as I mentioned, we sold off, that created a multi-million dollar um, which we use to fund a, a number of projects, and we'll go into that in a little more detail. So those are the grants. Here, gives, here is an idea of um, what we distributed in 2022, which is the number is a little larger than we normally allocate, but that's some holdover from prior years that we distributed in 2022. Typically, it's about $5 million between scholarships and grants. And uh, during 2022, uh, that affected 14,000 people directly. Um, by category, we have um, a pretty good distribution between education, uh, research, and uh, development and amateur radio. Our international reach has been increasing from year to year. Uh, in 2020, it was 9%. It's up to 22% in 2022, and we think we're going to have a little more climb in that in 2023. So all time, we've given out 187 grants, about $20 million, and that's affected about 71 
thousand people. So applying for a grant, you can apply at any time. We have four times a year that we collect up the grant applications that have come in. They go to our grants committee. Uh, the next two um, times that we're going to evaluate those is in uh, June 1st and, is that correct, or July 1st? July 1st. July 1st, the slide's incorrect. It's July 1st and October 1st. Uh, for more information, you go to ARDC.net, uh, apply and you'll read a whole bunch of information there. You can prepare your grant request either as a narrative and upload it, or we have a series of questions you can go through uh, that collects the information we want in order to evaluate your grant application. And that application actually happens at grants.ardc.net. So here are the requirements. You need to be a 501c3 nonprofit public charity or their international equivalent. And we have some processes to make that happen internationally, uh, but it does take a bit longer if you're international. A nonprofit educational institution, US and international, uh, government projects that align uh, with our mission. So that might be like a research project. Um, through a government entity, and we can fund those. If you're not in these categories, but are very similar to them, then we can um, work with what's called a fiscal sponsor that would be one of these types of organizations who then would manage the grant on your behalf, and we can make that happen. So there's several categories that we support, uh, support and growth of amateur radio, um, clubs, licensing classes, continuing education, uh, community outreach. We want to grow the ranks of amateur radio, particularly in underrepresented groups. Uh, in the education category, we uh, fund scholarships. We don't run those scholarship programs. We provide the funding to other organizations like AWRL, OMIC, uh, the Society of Engineers, and others who actually run the scholarship programs, but we provide the funding for them. We do K-12 school programs, um, college programs, programs aimed at underserved communities, again, are, are particularly of interest to us. Research and development, we, particularly we've uh, done some interesting areas here, uh, the M17 project, FreeDV, and uh, some satellite um, programs uh, in the third world we're uh, funding. So uh, review all of the information on our website. Um, most projects are targeted to about a year to two years. Um, and large projects, you might want to consider breaking them into phases and, and, and apply for grants over time. Uh, be sure you include all of the expenses, uh, materials, taxes, fees, building permits, everything that it's going to take to make that project happen. Uh, if you're buying equipment, we want you to select modern quality items uh, that will have an appropriate service life. Don't gold plate it, <laughs> but don't under, under specify. We don't want you to say, oh, well, Bill has uh, a 20-year-old repeater that we can buy cheap and, and refurbish. We'd rather you get something that's going to last a while. Uh, be sure that you include a project plan. Uh, with who, what, when, where, and, and why you're doing this project. Uh, we're looking for projects with a broad reach, social over commercial benefit, inclusion of underrepresented groups, empowerment of individuals uh, and a distributed organization, <coughs> preservation of the right to innovate, and anything that we fund has to be open source or open access. So 
if you're building, say, a repeater network and nobody can use it unless they join your club and pay dues and stuff like that, we're not going to fund that. Uh, you can certainly encourage people to join your club, but we want people that show up on things that we fund to feel welcome and um, have the ability to use it uh, with the requirement of, for example, having a license. And basically, tell us how your project will make the world a better place. Not that uh, Fred and I can talk over the mountain because we put a repeater between us, but by doing this, we're reaching out to the community and um, building a better, uh, better world, as it says. The process is pretty straightforward. Uh, the application deadline that we talked about earlier, it can take two to four months, maybe even a little longer if you're an international en entity just because of some uh, things we have to do so that the IRS doesn't come back and said, you're bad folks and we need to get rid of your uh, tax-free status. Um, if we need more information, we'll call you. So just real quick, these are the people that are on our grants advisory committee. They get together, they go through all the applications and try to pick out the best ones. Um, and once they've pulled that together, they create a portfolio, which we send to the board of directors. Um, and the board of directors has the final say on funding or non-funding. Um, Talk to us about it. There's, we have a booth here, uh, 1302 in the Maxim building. Um, and any questions you have, send to giving at ARDC.net. And that comes to both myself and Chelsea. And between the two of us, we can usually come up with an answer for you pretty quick. The other thing is 44Net, which is that address space that we were talking about. Uh, what is it? A, B, C, or D, uh, maybe some of any of those. Um, where does it fall in the internet? That little circle there uh, is reserved for ham radio in all the address space. Our addresses start with 44. That's the uh, original name of the network. It's built and operated by hams for hams. Um, we have the 12 million addresses. Um, generally, they're issued to amateurs who are licensed for use in non-commercial use, pretty much all non-commercial. Licenses are free to use. License C is responsible for obtaining connectivity. Here's some of the things you can use it for. Uh, Hamnet's a big network in Germany, uh, thousands of nodes. Uh, that are all interconnected on a multimedia network. Um, IRLP uses it, HamWAN, which is an IP-based digital network, um, more common here in the US. Uh, emergency communication, Internet of Things, IP, IP, mesh, repeater, infrastructure, SDRs, and email. But just about anything that can go over IP that uh, is ham-related uh, works. And uh, there is the, the rule that if you're sending it over RF, you can't encrypt to um, obscure the meaning of the message. But uh, other than that, pretty much anything that can go on IP, IP. Uh, John, did you bring in the box? This is uh, John Kemper. Here's our tech director. He's also in charge of 44Net. So this is something we're working on right now. Um, traditionally, it's been a little difficult to get configured and on the network. Um, we will still issue blocks of addresses to appropriate projects. This is an off-the-shelf router that you can buy um, on Amazon and other locations. Um, what's in this box is a full-blown internet router this particular one also includes an LTE modem, so it can climb on the cellular network to pass traffic. And uh, you can plug into a LAN port and run devices off of it. 
or you can plug it into your internet provider. And what it does is it creates a VPN to a server that we have that will allocate 44 net addresses for use in your station, your repeater site, wherever you might use it. Um, and it's cool. I mean, I have this on my D-Star repeater in my town uh, where there was not internet and using a really inexpensive IoT plan, I put the SIM in and I'm able to connect and get internet there for about $50 a year based on that SIM. So it's a pretty good thing. But the idea here is we're working on some infrastructure that we have in internal tests right now. And it takes about five minutes to configure this from the off the shelf box you get. And you have 44 net. Some of the cases that have been used, uh, this is part of the European infrastructure where they're using 44 network. And here's a case uh, that John has built where he's got a Raspberry Pi hanging off doing Internet of Things type of uh, projects and using the router to connect it back into 44 net, making it available for use. We have uh, a technical advisory committee. It's a more international group in scope. We've been fortunate there. Um, and they're doing a ton of work in documenting how this is all going to work, creating policy around it. Our policies have kind of been left up to one guy that um, has had to kind of make it up as he goes. So we're, we're working to solve that problem. Uh, anyway, really great group. John's leadership has just pulled together some um, excellent goals and a team to execute them. So we're glad to have him on board. He's our newest uh, member of the team. These are the committees that he's got going right now. Uh, one's mapping out the roadmap of where we're going. Uh, we're going to have a wiki with a bunch of documentation on it. So there's a group working on that. Uh, our network portable portal um, subcommittee is building our portals. Um, POPs would support this type of uh, infrastructure that we're talking about uh, with locations spread out for connectivity and a project so that if you wanted to build your own one of these using Raspberry Pi or something similar to that would have all the software ready for you to uh, build and install on your device. So for more information, go to ARDC.net. There you can sign up for our newsletter, uh, the 44 net mailing list, uh, and consider volunteering. Every fall we put out a call for people to join our grants committee and our um, technical advisory committee. And we have another one coming, but we'll save that one and another two. Um, code of Conduct Committee. Okay. Yeah, I can talk about that. Okay. So, um, plenty of ways to, to get involved, and you can uh, reach out to contact at ARDC.net if you have any questions. So, thank you. We'll take a few questions, and then we're going to go into the open forum, which Rosie will lead. Any questions? I'm sorry, I can't hear over this. If you could, there we go. Thank you. Uh, of all the addresses, the grand total addresses that are under the control of ARDC, mm -hmm. how many of them are currently in use? And uh, approximately. And so, number, number two go ahead. is that I saw on your map where you distributed international grants. One of them uh, was Russia. Is that currently or uh, Russia currently applying or being given something, or is that just legacy that they were in the past? So could you restate the second question? Okay. Since the start of the Russian Ukraine mm -hmm. war, has ARDC dispersed any money to Russia because it was indicated 
on the map when you put up the international map mm -hmm. of where the money is going internationally. Is it just the case of, okay, we gave it to them, you know, several years ago, no problem, but we're not going to do it now. Is, is that the case? In other words, if somebody from Russia comes and applies to ARDC, what is ARDC's policy toward dispersing money to Russia? Thank you. Okay, so the map is historical. Um, I'm not aware of anything we've issued in the last year or two uh, in the Rus Russian Federation. Um, we try not to be too political. We, we do like to uh, reach out and help people that need to be helped. The question as to the address space that's out there, how much of it is used, we've audited it. Um, in, in some ways it's not as easy to get the total count as one would think because we do allow certain people to get a subnet and BGP it and we don't know necessarily how many people are being used that. You know, you can do a port scan, but that means the machine's on it. There's a very simple answer to that question. Okay. There's a very simple answer to that question. It's minuscule. Yeah. That's probably it. Also, regarding uh, our grants and where they go, all that information is on our webpage. Go to the website and you can find a list of all the grants by year and who they were for and how much. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, but it is also misleading in that the entire address range is being used for scientific research in the background. So, um, and if you want more detail, come by our booth and we'll talk about that. But uh, the, the whole address space is in use. Anyone else? Down here in front. Question on uh, the 44 net, mm -hmm. the repeater system that uh, I'm the trustee of, we've got about 11 repeaters linked together, partially RF, partially through uh, IP. Mm -hmm. Our ISP provider, which is fiber, we buy, I forget the, the subnet number, but uh, it's six usable addresses, uh, IP addresses. With the 44 net, what, I'm trying to get my head around, uh, in my situation, mm -hmm. would the 44 net be advantageous for us because we take those six uh, public IPs break them down into private IPs, and that's how we communicate amongst our repeater system. John, I can answer that. Yeah, I, th I think I know what you're, you're talking about because I'm a member of repeater system with a very similar setup. If you would like uh, your host inside your network to be readily accessible for the outside, in other words, you can directly connect them from your home to a Network 44 address, this is exactly what you want. Though, so on the other hand, your repeater sites or whatever are just making outward connections, then it's not as useful. But if you want the first part, if you want to be able to get in for the general public and you have to protect yourself against that, Network 44 is exactly, that's what it is. Why are these addresses so valuable is they can be reached directly from the outside without all port forwarding nonsense. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I get, um, yeah, because, you know, the um, our ISP, ISP gives us, you know, this block. And yeah, then it's probably that, pretty small, too. Yeah, it's just yeah. six usable IP yeah. addresses. And from that point on, we have to uh, router at right. the connection, and then we distribute. Right. We are private, looking for so. uses for our address space. I mean, we have, quite frankly, an embarrassing number of unused addresses. And we prim primary use, first priority, is for ham use for a network. So if you have a block, need a block of addresses, come to us. Okay. You know, they don't cost us anything. They're sitting there. Now, we will, we will still own them, of course, but oh, yeah. for a ham use, no problem. Yeah, so. and that's something that, uh, you know, I assume that uh, the ISP could then put your 44. You may have to set up some tunneling, which okay. would not involve the, your ISP. Your, if your ISP is unusually enlightened, they would help you set this up, but I'm assuming they're not. You okay. would use one of these little boxes and set up some forwarding arrangements so that your users on the outside would think they're connecting to a network 44, but it would go through our infrastructure and end up on your hilltop or wherever. Okay. We have solutions to that. Yeah. Um, in general, is a, a several narrow grant requests better or a larger 
omnibus kind of, uh, we have a club that has many interests. We're in poor rural Tennessee. We would like to do some outreach to schools. We want to do the ham net. We want to do, uh, you know, link our repeaters. That's like three or four different things. Is it better to put that in one grant request or four? Well, it's really kind of a case by case issue. We tend to like any given organization to only have one grant running at a time. Uh, and the size of that depends on the justification, right? So depends on what you're putting together, but contact us through giving at ARDC.net and we'll help you have some guidance based on what you tell us and then we can help you figure out. But, you know, if it's going to take you three years to build it out, let's maybe look at breaking it into some chunks. Okay. All right, thank you, John. And, and sorry about my shakiness. My blood sugar was dropping quickly and it's recovering now, so. Which I am very grateful for, yay. Say so what? Um, so, okay, hi, I'm Rosie Schechter, KJ7RYV, and part of what, we're, we're running a little bit of an experiment for the second half of the, um, for the second half of the forum. The idea being, uh, the idea being that we want to actually hear from our grantees. Like one of the things that we've heard again and again and again from our grantees is that they actually want to meet each other. And so we kind of did it last minute, but we wanted to bring some of our grantees together. So can I actually see a show of hands? Like how many of you here have received a grant from ARDC? Okay. All right. One, two, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, awesome. Well, I'm actually curious, um, I, if you, not to put you on the spot too much, but would any of you like to share about your grant and what you're doing with the rest of the group? Anyone? Yeah, come on up. Huh? Oh, yeah, I guess. What, whatever works. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Ken. I run the radio scouting program in Central Florida Council. Our grant was to add solar, power, solar panels to our small MCOM demonstration trailer we do for scouting events. Uh, we do about a thousand scouts every month at different events. And one of the catches was we have a great trailer. It's got a few radios on it and we run a 300 foot extension cord to the nearest building so we can keep it charged for our 10 hour events, which it doesn't quite look very good for being hams. We're supposed to be always prepared. So our grant was $8,000. It's not very big, but it was for uh, two kilowatts of solar panel, and we have 900 amp hours of battery. So now we can last for two weeks with no power. Uh, the nice thing is it's great for all of our events, so we no longer need our extension cord, and the solar panels are always on the trailer, so they're always charging. Even when it's parked doing nothing, it's still charging for our different events. And should the worst case happen, uh, the local Aries group can take over the trailer and use it uh, during their different emergencies. Uh, part of that trailer has a 60-foot uh, extendable mast, and we have multiple different heads for doing Wi-Fi. We can actually pick up Wi-Fi from 70 miles away if we need to, because in a nice Florida, it's nice and flat. Things like to break, especially cell phone towers. Uh, oh, oh, um, yeah. Uh, you're only one of many grants for things like you're only one of many grants for things like solar panels and batteries. I mean, very low tech stuff that may seem boring, but a lot of people ask for that, and we know they're kind of pricey. And for things like repeaters, if you're really serious about an MCOM, I mean, you've got to get serious about backup power. So don't be afraid to apply for things like that if your repeater network is open and, and available. Just say one thing that made our grant a little special is our focus because we are um, youth focused. Um, all the hams here, I'm sure about 30% of you were scouts. So we are teaching the next generation. Yes, they are. 39% <laughs> so come from school programs, 34% come for scouts. Uh, we have uh, several dozen scouts to get licensed uh, every year from us. But the big thing is, is we have a larger percentage of diversity and uh, youth and also girls now are coming in there. About 30% of the kids I teach now are girls. And that was shocking 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So it is a way of us growing and a way of going forward where we can bring more youth in there, more different genders, more different diversity, and show them the latest and greatest in technology. Thank you. 
you. Cool. Um, any of our other grantees want to talk about what they do? Anyone in, who's in the room? Yes, no? Munir? Thank you. Munir is doing some really, really, really amazing work, actually. So I'm really, really grateful to hear from Munir. Hi. Um, hear me OK? So um, I'm from the Free DV project. Um, you might have heard ARDC's announcement a couple months ago about the grant we just got. So um, basically, if you're not familiar with what Free DV is, it's um, basically it's similar to, say, like DMR or DSTAR, but no patents and open source and more on HF. Since there's a lot of the digital voice stuff that's done on amateur radio right now is mainly just like on VHF and above using proprietary type codecs. So what, what we're doing, what we're planning on doing with the grant is basically um, using that money to put some effort into developing an improvement of 3DV and the Codec 2 library in general. So. Yeah. Let, let me add to that. Um, the reason that 3DV and M17 and projects like that are getting funded, what's the topic of this year's Hamvention? Innovation, and we want more R&D projects. So yeah, we, we are hurting for R&D projects. We're not getting as many as we thought we would. So if you've got an idea for something to develop and you're willing to make it open, that's an absolute requirement, then we are actually quite happy to talk to you. All right, right on. Thanks, Munir. All right, I did see a few more hands. Maybe if I could get one more f uh, person to come up and talk about what they do, if you want to. If not, that's OK. OK, well, I think that that kind of concludes what we were here to do. I'm going to hang around. John's going to hang around. John's going to hang around. Phil's going to hang around. Rhea's going to hang around. So if you have any questions, if you want to talk to us one-on-one, -on -one, we are here. And to the grantees in the room, feel free to meet each other. Uh, we've got some some folks who are working with clubs. We've got some folks, who are, or very few, but we've got a few folks who are working with clubs, someone working on the R&D side of the house. So yeah, talk amongst yourselves. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>